<clears throat> Hi. It's great to see you. Let's start for a moment with just a little practice, our short sit, <clears throat> arriving where we are. So find a way to sit just for the next three or four minutes in a comfortable and dignified posture. You can sit in a chair, you can sit on the floor, on a cushion or a bench, whatever way your body's comfortable and at ease on the earth. And if, as we go through these meditations and trainings, you find your body uncomfortable, you could notice that and, and work with it mindfully for a time. And then feel free to change posture or move. Just do so mindfully. So in accepting the invitations for presence just now, allow yourself first to look around where you are, opening mindfulness, awareness to the body and senses. See the colors around you in the room, the computer screen, the windows, the light, or the darkness. As you look around, relax and let yourself just take in your environment. And when you're ready, bring your attention back to yourself seated here and allow your eyes to close and relax more fully. Let the eyes and face be soft. Loosen the jaw. Let the shoulders relax and the arms and hands rest easily. So you're seated with a sense of dignity and alertness. At the same time, a deep invitation of presence and relaxation. <clears throat> and begin to notice the play of experience as you sit quietly. Notice the sounds that come and go. You can also note if there's any sense of smell or taste, odors from the flowers on the table or someone cooking nearby. Or maybe the words that I'm using which might evoke that sense. You can notice the body sensations, areas of ease or tightness warmth or cool, vibration or stillness, pleasure or pain. <clears throat> the feel of this body received with a kind attention. You can notice the state of the heart as well. Is there interest or gratitude or sadness and grief or excitement or tenderness? Does the heart feel open or closed? Without any judgment, just noticing life for you as it is right now. <clears throat> Let's return to the state check-in practice we started in our first meeting, this time without noting place. So I'm not here to listen for you, but I am Michael. There is tiredness anticipation, and affection. So, continuing our discussions on mindfulness meditation, the session today is on mindfulness of emotions and feelings. <clears throat> the second foundation of mindfulness. After the foundation of mindfulness of the body, in the body, inwardly and outwardly, and of the breath is the Foundation of Mindfulness of Feeling. And it says in the texts, the one who's practicing becomes aware of the feelings that are present, of the feelings in the feelings, which means to really sense them deeply, inwardly, and outwardly. And initially becomes aware this is a pleasant feeling, this is an unpleasant feeling. This is a neutral feeling. And you can hear in this the spirit of mindfulness and loving awareness, 
which is witnessing and observing what's happening. This is pleasant. This is unpleasant. Unhooked from judging or reactivity or trying to make it a certain way. <clears throat> this is the way it is. Praise and blame, gain and loss, pleasure and pain, joy and sorrow, birth and death. These opposites weave together to create the experience of human incarnation. And mindfulness, loving awareness, compassion says, ah, <clears throat> this is an unpleasant experience. This is a pleasant one. This is a neutral one. Our usual habit is reactivity. Pleasant. Ooh, I like it. How do I get more? How do I get it to stay? Unpleasant. Oh, fear, resistance. I don't want this. Turning away. Neutral, <clears throat> which we have quite a bit. Oh, time to go to sleep or back to my little screen, you know, distract myself. And so all of them, when, then, when not acknowledged, can put us in a reactivity or put us to sleep in some way. These are called the primary feelings in the Buddhist psychology from which this taxonomy is drawn. They give rise to the secondary feelings, which is what we're talking about now. The words pointing to both feeling and emotion. And that is a stream of experience that happens with us. Just as we have a river of physical sensations and sense experiences that arise moment to moment in consciousness, so too, there is a river of feelings. There is also a river of thoughts. You probably know, and we'll get to explore that next week. And people sense their feelings in different ways. Some people sense their feelings with their mind and somehow associate it with thought. Some people sense their feelings with the heart more. There's a kind of welling of different forms of emotion anger or fear or love or longing or delight. Many people sense their feelings primarily in the body and some can sense in all of these. But often people only have one of these channels open and to become more mindful of them, to become more mindful of feeling requires them in some way also to begin to expand that capacity to sense feeling as it arises. And many of the feelings that we have are unconscious until we notice. So Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas said, at the Supreme Court level where I work, 90% of our decisions are made on the basis of what we feel about things, our feelings. And the other 10% is our rationalization where we use our mind to justify what we feel. And if it's true on the Supreme Court, it's pretty much the basis of how we relate to the world, how we feel toward it. So one of the first things that I can do is teach people how to be mindful of feelings. So they're not caught so much in entanglement and reactivity and grasping and all the things that make the suffering of life. One of the first things that I can do is normalize feelings and reassure people that whatever they're feeling is just a feeling and it's human and it's normal. When I was a much younger man, a boy actually, I was living in Madison, Wisconsin, attending the University of Wisconsin and there was a, a knock on my door. I was a non-traditional student, so I was an older student. And I made myself vulnerable to armed robbery. And there it was. About three minutes later, my shaking hand closed the door, and I, I noted to myself something like, well, that was a scary experience. There was fear just then. And it wasn't like it was a bad feeling or I was supposed to be too cool to sweat it. It was just what it was. It's like going to Disneyland and taking the, the e-ticket ride. You know, it's the kind of most extreme ride without telling myself a story about why and who and what next, without taking the time to do that, it just was what it was in the moment. 
in our first year of training as mindfulness meditation teachers, <laughs> we're handed a list of 52 different basic psycho psychophysical states through which humans can experience their reality. And from those states, there's this list of 500 emotions, alphabetized. Sometimes when I talk about emotions, I'll just pick a letter like C, and I'll go calm, capable, cheerful, captivated, cautious, chagrined, challenged, childish, clever, cold-hearted, combative, comfortable, compassionate, confident, confused, conscientious, competitive, contemptful, contrite, courageous, conservative, cowardly, cranky, cruel. It's an amazing source of noting possibilities. And we can, we can read on and on and you realize that the literal description of the river of feelings is true. We have this capacity to feel, it's very rich. And yet it's generally not part of our education, you know? We learn to read and to write and to do some math in school, but we don't learn about this primary human experience. So mindfulness invites us, loving awareness, we use the terms interchangeably at times to begin to attend to and learn how to live in more conscious relation to feeling. And just as I quoted last week in my talk about the body, again, here is Pema Chodron. It's very helpful to realize that the emotions we have, the negativity and positivity, are exactly what we need to be fully human, fully aware, and fully alive. So, this is where we awaken. We also pick up feelings from other people. The nervous system of our bodies is tuned to one another in what used to be called limbic resonance or mood contagion. In this latest century, there are theories and research around mirror neurons, transcending our individual boundaries, intersubjective experience put a violin on the table and someone else plays the violin somewhere else and the strings on the one sitting on the table resonate with it. Interbeing. We resonate with one another. We even resonate with the culture. The mood right now is bringing the fear into the culture and it resonates in that primitive part of everybody's brain. And it can't be helped because we're all wired together. So the good thing is that mindfulness or loving awareness can hold it all. A historical Buddha taught about sati sampajana. The additional defining factor that Scott Bishop, if you remember from session one, that mindfulness also clear, uh, includes clear comprehension, which invites an appropriate response. So Mary Oliver writes a poem where she says, meditation is old and honorable. So why should I not sit quietly every morning of my life on the hillside, looking into the shining world? Because properly attended to, delight is as well as havoc is only a suggestion, only a beginning. And she goes on, can, can one be passionate about the just, the sublime, the holy, and yet commit no labor to its cause? I don't think so. You must act, be ignited, or gone. <clears throat> and so there is an invitation both to feel inwardly and outwardly, to sense with mindfulness, and also to allow that feeling to inspire or inform a wise action, a wise response. That's another part of mindfulness. The first step in guiding people to understand feelings is simply teaching them to know what they feel, helping, inviting them to actually experience what they feel. When we notice feelings, pleasant or not, or neutral, rising into consciousness, we get to take the moment to sit with it and see what we're believing or what stories the feeling is arising from. Opening to fully feeling allows us to know the mental discourse that accompanies the feeling. My partner and I are speaking more and more about her work as a massage therapist, therapeutic massage, and how 
She works with other people's damaged bodies. Well, over the years, hers is becoming unwell as a result. So I notice I have this gnawing ache in my heart and a, a ruminating sense of nausea and uh, you know, impending something, you know. It bothers me that she suffers and that I have to hear about it. So recently it rose up and then again and again, and I, I thought to sit with it with some curiosity. But I began to lean into my inner experience in, in all that was tumultuously going on in there. There was greater honesty and clarity because I took time to begin to pay attention and listen and name it. Remembering to trust that awareness could tune in to my feelings. Fear, fear about her and our future. So as I opened up to it, my sense of suffering also increased, widening my partner's difficulties, the sufferings of other people, the pain of her hard labor and that of people like her <clears throat> and suffering of those whose bodies they work with. The other illness and uncertainty in the world became visible. And then I began to experience a welling up, not, not just of fear, but of compassion. And a kind of relief broke through me with that compassion. And now as I think about her during the day, there's a, a greater sense of care and trust that grows uh, it, from a, a more gracious heart. And I think I become a more loving person because I know what I'm feeling, and I, and then I get to be more direct with her. I'm less afraid. And with that, I realize that I can begin to tolerate the experiences that are there within me. So it's a description of somebody's process of learning to feel what, what they feel, and the kind of questions when someone doesn't have much connection with feeling are, well, where do I feel that in my body? Close your eyes for a moment. What do you notice in your body? Or do you feel a little numb? Where do you feel that in your body? And as you start to feel that, what images come? What stories come? And the images and stories sometimes invite the feeling to come more fully. It's okay. Become present for the feelings and then begin to notice and sense what's around it. And there's something true about that because what's beautiful, if you, took, if you look into the tradition of Buddhist psychology and other frameworks is that the kinds of feelings that we deal with are spelled out in articulate and beautiful ways. And one of the most common lists, one of the many in Buddhist psychology is the list of hindrances that arise. And they're called hindrances only because they're hindrances to clarity. There's not something you have to do about them. You just have to notice, oh, caught, trapped in that hindrance. And so there is the hindrance of the grasping, wanting mind. In India, they say that when a pickpocket meets a saint, he only looks to see what's in his pockets. He can't see the saintliness because that desire blinds him. And you go into some room and, and you look at, you know, who's, who's somebody I want to be with? Who do I not want to be with? And who don't I care about or something? There's, there's this scanning that desire makes where we get attached to our perception locked in and so we can't see clearly well the second hindrance that comes you're, you're you're sitting there trying to meditate the first one is desire or you know i want this and that i want this state and when i leave here i want to go and have this to eat and i hope this happens and you get filled with anything but what your own experience is the second one which is resistance is i don't like this i'm afraid of it I'm angry. It's the pushing away of experience. So that you're sitting there and all of a sudden, I want a different experience. 
this is not what I like. This is not supposed to be happening. Or I'm afraid of this. And so again, there's a reactivity. Uh, and, and you sit with being caught in anger or judgment or fear, just as I was and am when I'm afraid about our future. There's this pushing away, an aversion that mindfulness gets to notice. Or you can sit and be caught in restlessness. And it comes, you know, and you, you get really restless. And what do you do when you're restless? You start to become mindful. This is desire. This is grasping. This is anger. Oh, this is restlessness. Restlessness feels like this. And you let the loving awareness become big enough to tolerate it, <clears throat> to allow it, to hold it, to name it gently. Restless, restless. Oh, I hate this hating, hating. I want it to go away, wanting, wanting. Oh my gosh, I'm really learning to do this, you know? Pride, pride. And you know, you start to track the feelings that are present as they are, without trying to change them. Or sleepiness. As we've talked about before, it gets normalized. This is fine. It's natural to be sleepy at times because you're tired or because you're a human being. Or doubt. I can't do this. It's too hard. The wrong day. It's the wrong practice. I'm not worthy enough to awaken. Or whatever you think about yourself. I'll never live a more conscious life. I'm doubting myself in all kinds of ways. Or you doubt other things in your life. Or you doubt the teachers. I mean, who are these people anyway? You know? And then... With these feelings and other difficult emotions, fear, shame, sorrow, longing, guilt, anxiety, they all come up. Attachment in the strong form of addiction will come up as you're sitting, doesn't it? Or jealousy will come. Oof. There's an interesting emotion. And the whole construct of ideas, you know, but underneath is this feeling of jealousy and not being enough and wanting something else, or the feelings of, of being hurt. <clears throat> and we've all been hurt, wounded, and profoundly hurt. Or the feelings of anger, or even rage. And, and what do you do with them? This again is a Zen teacher, Carl Fried Durkheim. He says, the person who is really on the path, on the way, on the path, falls upon hard times, will not, as a consequence, turn to those friends who offer them refuge and comfort and encourage their old self to survive. Rather, they will seek out those who will faithfully and inexorably help them to risk themselves so that they may endure the difficulty and pass courageously through it. Only to the extent that a person exposes themselves over and over again to difficulty. And even annihilation, he says, and this has to be the right context, by the way, can that which is indestructible be found within them? And this daring, in this daring lies dignity and the spirit of true awakening. Wow. So there's something truly liberating about being able to stay in the presence of strong emotions with loving awareness and say, yes, this too is part of being human. But it's not just those painful and difficult ones, you know, because as you know, many of us can be loyal to our suffering. <laughs> and then the positive emotions are difficult. When we start to feel joy, is that okay? When we start to feel rapture or we start to feel love or delight or ease, or bliss. Not long ago at my job, a student in crisis was saying, I don't know, I don't know what I'm feeling. And I said, well, settle down. Sense your body. He said, well, I, I live such a busy life and I'm always trying to do things. Settle down. Feel what it is right now. 
He said, well, I'm happy to be here right now in this boring, nothing happening moment. I said, okay, just tune in. What are you sensing? He said, oh, his eyes changed like this was so unfamiliar. And he said, ah, I think it's contentment. And he'd never had a moment of contentment in a conscious way, probably in months at least. Now, what feelings need in order to be acknowledged wisely is respect. They're powerful. You might remember the story of that small group of American soldiers in Iraq who were surrounded by people during the war, shouting and so forth. And the officer, at some point, the platoon leader, instinctively knowing this could get out of hand, instead he said, take a knee. And they all turned their rifles to the ground and kneel down on one knee. Now, this was in front of a great mosque in the, in the holy city of Najaf. And when they did that, everyone around them became quiet. And these people were so angry at them. And then they withdrew without anyone being hurt. And what it was, was a gesture of respect. Emotions also want your respect for whatever power they have in them, whatever delight, whatever wound they carry. <clears throat> can you bow to this too and say, yes, yes, this too can be held in loving awareness. With practice, we get to build a sense of trust or confidence that the space of awareness and compassion is big enough to hold it all. I've learned this again and again. And whatever that feeling is, space can hold it. Compassion can hold it. And it's a beautiful thing to know this, right? Please try one of these times that something scary or anger arises or grief. <laughs> Sit in the middle of it for as long as it lasts and see what happens to it. Believe me, it's totally possible to sit in the midst of it all. A good thought or listening exercise is asking what range of emotions are okay for you and what's outside of your comfort zone. And the beautiful and most powerful thing is that we can learn to be present for them. We can turn toward fear, leaning in. So go to the places that scare you and when you're ready, not, not right away, and take your seat in the middle and bid them be present. And learn that you can do this too, as a human being, or as Afiz says, with loneliness. Don't surrender your loneliness so quickly. Let it cut more deeply. Let it season you as few ingredients can. Or the broken heart, where Oscar Wilde writes so simply, hearts are meant to be broken. <clears throat> so you allow yourself to be present with the sorrow, the fear or whatever, and then here's what helps you find it in your body. You're invited to say, where do I sense this in my body? Can I hold this feeling, whatever it is that's difficult, especially with compassion? Or if it's a beautiful feeling, can you hold this with joy? Where's the center of this feeling? Some, sometimes that's helpful to go right to the center. What happens if you let this feeling open and expand? So there I am sitting with anger. Teacher says, all right, you're going to be angry, let it happen. And then it turns into rage and all these other emotions without judging it. This from Elizabeth Taylor. The problem with people who have no vices is that generally you can be sure they're gonna have some pretty annoying virtues. So we have these ideas about how we're supposed to be. The perfectionist ideas. I shouldn't feel this and do that. I shouldn't be angry. I shouldn't feel fear and so on. And the, the repression of that actually knots us up 
that keeps us from being fully alive. And the beautiful thing is that very directly with our mindfulness teachings, we expand what neuroscience calls our window of tolerance. You expand the heart to be able to be present for it all. So the point in all this is not to get rid of feelings or to have some notion of the right feelings, because grief needs to be felt. And the outrage sometimes, that injustice is what needs to be felt. It actually inspires us in some powerful way. But it's not the end of the story. Feelings, that's the beautiful thing. No feeling is final. They're leading us to some greater understanding. This from Molly Ivins, who is the great New York Times columnist, humorist, and Texas fire, firecracker. As a voice for justice, she says, <clears throat> so keep fighting for freedom and justice, beloveds, but don't forget to have fun doing it. Be outrageous. Rejoice in all the oddities freedom can produce. And when you get through celebrating the sheer, sheer joy of a good fight, be sure to tell those who follow how much fun it was. So you start to feel that your capacity to enter into life grows with your capacity to be open to the range of feelings and to bring them to what you do. Mindfulness is like this. Anger is like this. Grief is like this. Longing is like this. Joy, bliss is like this. Bow to each. And they change like the weather. In fact, when you get very still, just as in the body training that we were doing in the previous session, <clears throat> what seemed a solid pain in the body was not pain. Pain's the word. It was throbbing, tingling, pinpricks, fire. It dissolves into a whole field of changing sensations, and, and the body itself is a field of changing sensations. So, interestingly enough, when you get quiet and you really pay attention, feelings don't last a long time. You know, oh, I've been depressed for so long. But you sit there and you notice that you're sad, and if you name it sad, sad for a time and become mindful, as we've been training to do, <clears throat> sad, sad, and sense it in the body, sad, sad. It moves like a wave through mind and body. And after 15 or 30 seconds, you might feel an aversion. Oh, I wish this would go away. And then, okay, you notice wishing has come as a feeling. Or I wish I weren't so sad. And you notice that wishing. And I hate this sadness, hating, hating. Okay, but I'm so sad, 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 sad. I'm afraid this is gonna last all week. Fear, fear arises, fear, fear. And I can be with it, okay. Confidence arises, sad, sad, again. And again, I'm not doing bad, pride, pride, whatever. And you start to realize as you track them that these emotions are alive and ever-changing in the body, in the mind, and in the heart. That our window of tolerance expands. And we get this increasing confidence that we can be with what's here. And that's contagious itself. So often people ask me what, what's changed over the years. You know, I've been doing all this practice since I was a kid. So what's different? I sometimes think of it that there's just less lag time between being caught. There's an emotion there, and in some way, pushing away or avoiding. And, oh, okay, it's this again. And a question that served me a lot. There's a story of a well-known sage who says that the one thing we're going to ask ourselves that can really open it up is, what are you unwilling to feel? Because in most moments, if we're all unconscious, it's because in some way we're pushing away something that's just part of the nature of things. So in that spirit, it's all inner weather. Here's a poem by Dana Falls, and this is called Allow. 
There is no controlling life. Try controlling a lightning bolt, containing a tornado, dam a stream, and it will create a new channel. Resist and the tide will sweep you off your feet. Allow, and grace will carry you to higher ground. The only safety lies in letting it all in. The wild and the weak, fear, fantasies, failures, and success. When loss rips off the doors of the heart or sadness veils your vision with despair, practice becomes simply bearing the truth. In the choice to let go of your known way of being, the whole world is revealed to new eyes. And what I love about this is that so much of the stuck place of who we are, that kind of small self, is really organized around the way we don't feel or be with or open to what's here. So the more that we're able to allow a feeling and letting that lag time decrease gently, carefully, wisely, reconnecting, what it does is it reveals a whole new sense of being. The last thing to say, and we're not gonna do this in this session, is that it's also possible that when you notice patterns of feeling that you get caught in that are unhealthy, the feelings themselves aren't unhealthy, but they're combined with unhealthy thought patterns that after acknowledging them, at some point, it becomes possible to shift to more healthy feelings. So whether it's shame or whether it's rage or things, and after a while, rather than dwelling in them, it's possible to shift both thought and feelings to loving kindness or to a sense of well-being or self-care or focus on inner peace or a kind of confidence or gratitude. But the reason I don't want to even talk about it at this point is because our tendency is to try to fix things and make them go away. And the main liberation comes in the courage, if you will, that grows in you to be able to stay present for the full range of emotions. That is the, it's part of the birthright of humanity. Not only to be alive, but to be alive with all of what makes you up. And that's the great gift that you'll have. And then learning how to modify it. Later on, we'll come to that, maybe. <clears throat> Perhaps some of you in the room don't know what a, a fado is, but it's a beautiful, kind of heartfelt melancholy genre that comes from Iberia, you know, from Spain and Portugal, that region. And in part, I think it comes from the, the Roma and Gypsy traditions, the little bit that I know, and forgive me if I got it wrong. <clears throat> but this is a poem from Jane Hirschfield. It's called Fado. And she sets the scene. She says, with a sleight of hand, the magician reaches close and lifts a quarter from inside a girl's ear, and from her hands takes a dove she didn't know was there. Which amazes more, you may wonder, <clears throat> the quarter's murmur against the thumb, or the dove's seduced silence, that they magically appeared, or that in Portugal, the same half-stopped moment, it's almost dawn, and a woman in a wheelchair is singing a fado, that puts every life in the room on one pan of a scale and itself in the other, and the copper bowls balance. Let's, let's take a moment for self-care, an invitation to stand and stretch, grab a fresh beverage. I'll ring the bell to bring us back.
I know. I know that was a short five minutes. So we're going to run over. So kindly make your way to your most comfortable seating place. <clears throat> this evening, we're going to practice a mindfulness of emotions meditation. Most of it, the core practice that you should all have in heart by the end of this course, the grounding, the establishing mindfulness part will sound familiar. I'll ring a bell to begin guiding the meditation and invite you to open your eyes to close the meditation. The practice will take about 12 minutes. So let yourself sit in an upright yet comfortable way. And when you're ready, close your eyes or soften your gaze. Notice if there's any obvious tension in the body that you can release easily and, and do so. Let the, let the eyes face be soft. Relax the shoulders and let the arms and hands rest easily. Let the belly be soft. And the, the breath natural. Now let the heart be soft as well to receive whatever arises with kindness and compassion. <clears throat> now within this em embodied presence, bringing awareness to the breath, moving through your body, entering and exiting as the breath joins with the larger element air. Air moving in, air moving through, air moving out. Take a moment to rest and savor the presence of the earth and air always with you. Feel each breath and as you allow it, invite a sense of calm and ease to grow. Return gently to the next breath whenever you notice the attention has wandered. Wandering is a natural process, so no judgment. Let all other experiences, sounds, sensations, thoughts, and images rise and fall like waves of the ocean around the breath. After a time, because Become mindful of any emotions that call your attention. You can bring the same mindful loving awareness to them as you have to the breath. So when an emotion arises, letting go of attention to the breath and receive the emotion kindly. It can be helpful to name it slowly as we've done. Sad, sad, or joy, joy, or Bored, bored, or anxious, anxious, or excited, excited. And as you attend to the emotion, notice carefully where you feel it in your body. And notice how it feels as a constellation of sensations. How does it respond to kind awareness? Does it dissolve and get stronger? Does it change into another emotion? And notice this too. You are the space of loving awareness that can kindly notice emotions as they come and go. If you feel resistance to contacting the emotion or it feels very strong, notice the story that the mind tells along with the feelings in your body <clears throat> and acknowledge it kindly then let this be in the background and again, bring a gentle presence to the emotion. When the emotion has changed or dissolved, return back to the awareness of breath for a time. Now you can include emotions in your loving awareness as well as attending to the breath and body. They come and go and 
you are becoming the calm, steady witness, acknowledging them without getting caught by each one. Remaining in mindful, loving awareness, you become gradually more open, balanced, and free. <clears throat> I bow to you in gratitude, your attention. Thank you. Many contemplative traditions with practices, rituals, focused learning, and dialogue close their meeting with a dedication practice. Not keeping what's good just for ourselves and our immediate circle of loved ones is a radical act of generosity. There are limitless forms of dedication. I think it's a really nice habit. So, this is the one that you'll continue to hear from me. Let us dedicate all the value accrued through prayer, contemplation, meditation, and practice for the benefit of all beings and to the incomparable expanse of totality. See you again soon. Go with love and well-being. May you be at ease. See you soon.